A warm welcome to online worship from Dunkeld Cathedral here on the banks of the beautiful River Tay. It's a lovely day as well, something we've not seen a great deal of during May admittedly, but now the weather's improving a bit and people can move around more. If you happen to be in Dunkeld on the next couple of Saturdays, the 5th or the 12th of June, we will be holding a second-hand book sale outside the Duchess Anne, which is our church hall, to raise money for Christian aid. So donations of books are needed, as are purchasers. So please come along, we'd be glad to see you, and you can bring books, and you can take a bag away with you to raise money for a good cause. Next week, the online service will be a bit different. So the service will centre on three interviews with members here at the Cathedral Congregation who will talk about their faith and their church involvement and then pick a favourite hymn recorded by our virtual choir. So Annie Hogg and John Martin have that in hand for next weekend. Our choir has done a fantastic job over the past year and a bit. We've had contemporary pieces, traditional hymns, some wonderful solos, all sorts of things. And I thought many weeks, well, that couldn't be bettered. But it has been today. Because in the service we have an anthem from the 16th century, If Ye Love Me, a well-known piece written by Thomas Tallis. And when you listen to this, you may have heard it already on the YouTube channel where it's been up as a, an individual item, but it's part of the service later on. And bear in mind that this is recorded by members of the choir individually in their own homes and then somehow by some technical wizardry is welded together by Hazel into what you will hear. So there's a real treat to hear later on. The focus of today's service is the incident with Nicodemus recorded in John chapter 3. Nicodemus who comes to Jesus by night to find out more, to talk to him and explore a bit. But we begin first of all with our opening hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Thank you. 
When Isaiah had his vision in the temple, his call to be a prophet, seraphim were in attendance and they cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And Isaiah's reaction was, Woe is me, I'm doomed. For my own eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I, a man of unclean lips. I who dwell among a people of unclean lips. But one of the seraphim flew down and took a burning coal and touched his lips and said, This has touched your lips. Now your iniquity is removed and your sin is wiped out. I heard the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? I said, Here am I. Send me. Let us pray. Holy and eternal God, you are beyond all human knowing, above space and time, greater than our minds can grasp, ruler over all. In you is found love and wisdom. We worship you. Loving Father, kind and merciful, you are full of compassion and goodness beyond all measure, watching over us and guiding our steps. We worship you. Lord Jesus, you came amongst us, giving your life that we might live. We worship you. Holy Spirit, with us now, you inspire and give strength to such as us. In you we are made new. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we worship you, the one eternal, holy God. And when we look inwards, we know that we have let you down and disappointed ourselves by thoughtlessness and deliberate wrong. We should be like Isaiah, trembling before your majesty. Were it not for your mercy and grace in Jesus Christ, offering forgiveness, a fresh start, a place in your family. Humbly we receive your grace. Bless our time in worship now, to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray and to say these words, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This reading is from the Gospel of St John, chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. One of the Pharisees called Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish council, came to Jesus by night. Rabbi, he said, we know that you are a teacher sent by God. No one could perform these signs of yours unless God were with him. Jesus answered, In very truth I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he has been born again. But how can someone be born when he is old? asked Nicodemus. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, In very truth I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born from water and spirit. Flesh can give birth only to flesh. It is spirit that gives birth to spirit. You ought not to be astonished when I say, you must all be born again. The wind blows where it wills, you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born from the spirit. How is this possible? asked Nicodemus. You, a teacher of Israel and ignorant of such things, said Jesus. In very truth I tell you, we speak of what we know 
and testify to what we have seen, and yet you all reject our testimony. If you do not believe me when I talk to you about earthly things, how are you to believe if I should talk about the things of heaven? The story of Nicodemus is perhaps best remembered for one thing only, that statement in verse 3, you must be born again. It's something which has become very controversial, contentious, often divisive within the Christian community. Are you born again is a question that could put some folk into raptures about a particular moment when they had a dramatic experience and they became a Christian. But it also throws others into a frenzy of self-examination as they look for some evidence that they are indeed born again because they didn't have such an experience which is a great pity because there's so much more to it than just that. And maybe what we should do is not start by thinking about what's this born again experience business, but go back a stage to find out what's going on. Because it begins with someone wondering, Nicodemus, clearly unsettled by what he's heard of this new teacher from Nazareth, and he wants to investigate further, find out what he really thinks. And there are very few of us who don't do that. We all wonder, wonder what we believe, wonder as we look at the mysteries of life and creation and our place in it, what is it all about? And sometimes life throws things at us that make us question that even more. And it's a very rare person who wouldn't give thought to the ultimate questions in life. And in fact, it's dangerous not to, because that way lies excessive dogmatism, bigotry, ultimately rivalry, as we shut out those we deem not to be right by our way of thinking. Nicodemus was such a man in a way, he, he had his views, but he wondered and questioned, which is surely a very healthy thing to do. So he came to Jesus. Now, what do we know about Nicodemus? Well, we know he was a Pharisee, John tells us that. He was on the, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. That was 70 eminent men who made decisions about big matters and gave judgments. So he was probably of a good family, a good lineage. He was probably quite well off too. In fact, he makes an appearance again at the end of John's gospel when he goes to help with the burial of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea offers the tomb and John tells us Nicodemus is there with over half a hundred weight of spices for the purpose. So he's clearly um, quite comfortably off, a man of means, a man who had good standing, who was well into his society and his religion, settled. Only he wasn't. He was very unsettled, very rattled, obviously, by this new teacher from Nazareth. And he came to find out more, wondering What's he saying and how does that fit with me? Now, had he been of a closed mind, as many of his contemporaries would have been, he'd have shut down all debate. That's nothing to do with me. It's wrong because he would already know what was right. He didn't need anyone else to tell him or give any further consideration. And that type would rather crucify to silence the voice and the wonderings and the searching than listen to it. So he had a lot of face to save. He had a position, and still he wonders, what are the answers? What's it about? What does he mean? John, in his typical way of writing, includes a wee detail about Nicodemus that you might think, well, why is that there? That Nicodemus came by night in the darkness. Why would he put that in? unless to indicate that Nicodemus was in the darkness in more ways than one, or maybe to indicate that Nicodemus was skulking about in the shadows and wanted to find out more before he would go public on his views about this Jesus of Nazareth. But undoubtedly, he was a searcher and a wanderer, which is where we all are, surely, if you're a thinking person at all, you have to look at human life and the mysteries of life and our place in creation, ponder all these things to try and understand it 
and make sense of it. Like Nicodemus, we too have our questions and our searching. Nicodemus is in darkness in more ways than one, not just physical, but he wants some light on the matter. So he comes to Jesus. Well, what about this business of being born again? Those who know about such things point out that the Greek word for again can't really be translated adequately into one English word. It could mean born in a new way, born from the beginning, born radically, born from above, i.e. born of God in the life of the Spirit. And it contains all those ideas. Unfortunately, the whole idea has been hijacked and become a touchstone of authenticity and orthodoxy for many as far as faith goes. The phrase born again Christian carries with it associations of a particular theology and often with a particular political outlook as well. The born again moment can become the litmus test of your faith for some. However, the moment as far as I'm concerned, is neither here nor there. To keep going back to the moment of birth would be the equivalent of framing your birth certificate, putting it on the wall in your house, and when anyone comes into the house, before they can do anything else or talk about anything, they have to examine the birth certificate to verify that you are indeed alive. In fact, before, in the days before the moment of birth, was recorded and certified by a registrar, that didn't mean people weren't alive and they had a rough idea of when they were born, but it didn't matter. The moment of birth was not the important thing. What matters is being alive. But some keep rehearsing the moment of birth as if that were all that mattered, the spiritual birth. 
which would be like going into the garden and instead of admiring a rose in bloom, you dig it up every time and look at the roots to see what they're like. It's needless. For some people, undoubtedly, they have a decisive moment, a very dramatic experience. It certainly wasn't that way for me. But the key thing is to live the life of the Spirit, regardless of how or when it started. And people who keep stressing the moment of conversion or looking for that in other people are missing the point that it's a process of growth. So how then might we understand this business of being born again or born from above in terms of the Nicodemus story? Well, as I said earlier, it begins in darkness. Darkness, which is often a solitary experience. Now to us, darkness is often a scary thing. It's about things that go bump in the night. But actually, when you look at some of the teaching, in, especially in Jesus' teaching, there's an implication that that's part of the process. He used seeds a lot as an image and a parable of growth of the kingdom, sowing the seeds. And when you do that in a garden, you're aware that you bury them in the ground and they're in the dark for a while, working away, you don't know how, and then the plant erupts through the soil and grows in the light. So the early growth takes place in secret, away from sight. When you try to grow something like hyacinths in the winter time, you put them in a bowl of peat and then you've got to put them in a cupboard in the darkness and leave them there for a few weeks until they begin to come through. Then at the right time, you take them out of the cupboard into the light and then they flourish. If you didn't bring them out into the light, the plant would be yellow, straggly and unhealthy. It's the same with physical birth. We grow in the darkness of the womb until the time is right when we see light. We come out into the light to continue the journey. And I find that a very helpful ma metaphor in the spiritual process too, that like Nicodemus, much of our wondering and pondering may be done in darkness in private, secretly. Because we're uncertain, maybe we're not ready to admit yet where our thoughts are going. So it begins to form in the darkness. But unless that is birthed into the open and into the light, unless it becomes a lived thing, then the plant of faith will never grow. If it remains in the dark, in secret, it will be yellow and straggly and unhealthy. So there comes a time when the, the covert must become overt out in the open. And that fits with some of the things Jesus said. Uh, for example, the parable of the hidden seed, which goes into the ground and grows. No one knows how, Jesus says, it just grows and then it emerges from the soil. Or the, the words he talks about, things that are said in secret must be out in the open. They will be proclaimed from the rooftops. Because without coming out into the light, it won't grow. In fact, he says to Nicodemus in verse 3, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he or she is born again or from above. You cannot begin to understand or glimpse the truth if you're still hidden away in the dark, in your musings and wondering, and you're not prepared to step out into the light of the kingdom and live it. And that's the time when the wondering becomes following. We may ponder and wonder within ourselves, but there has to come a moment when it's out in the light, when it's out in the open, so that it will grow properly. So unless we take that step out of the darkness into the light, we will never be able to see the life of the kingdom. And that step out, I think, is our own commitment, our own decisiveness to follow. It's our Christian service when we put our wonderings into conclusions and into action, when we serve the church and live the life of the kingdom in the world, not hidden, but out in the open. And I don't care about the moment or the manner of birth. It's the life that matters, 
to be born from above and alive to Christ's kingdom within us and around us. Nicodemus started in secret in the darkness, but he had to come out into the light and begin that journey of following. If we have been guilty of hiding faith under cover of darkness to save face or to avoid challenge, forgive us, Lord. If we have been reluctant to surrender completely to the ways of your kingdom, forgive us. If we have been fearful of the road we might be led on, Reassure us that you go ahead to lead the way. May your love grow in us, that faith would blossom and flourish into deeper Christian service and commitment. Thank you for our birth and rebirth again and again in your mercy, which is new every morning. This reading is from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 17. It follows, my friends, that our old nature has no claim on us, we are not obliged to live in that way. If you do so, you must die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the base pursuits of the body, then you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. The Spirit you have received is not a spirit of slavery, leading you back into a life of fear, but a spirit of adoption, enabling us to cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit of God affirms to our spirit that we are God's children, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. But we must share his sufferings if we are also to share his glory. In that passage in Romans, there's a, a logical follow-on from this talk of rebirth or new birth, in that Paul speaks about being children of God. So, as we are born, children, so we are born as children of God in the Spirit. What grows in the darkness emerges into the light with life. So being, being of the Spirit is to be a child of God. Now, for Nicodemus, this was a big deal because he was a child of Abraham, and that was by physical birth. That was his lineage, and it was considered important by people from the same stable as him. Do you remember when John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness and he came to the River Jordan to baptize? Many came out of the city to see him, including scribes and Pharisees. And John doesn't mince his words. Brood of vipers, he says. How can you presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father? That means nothing in John's eyes. Why? Well, because that was a closed shop. You either were born in that lineage or you weren't, and there's nothing you can do about it. I can't change the fact where I was born or to whom I was born, and nor can you. But what Paul writes here is, it's for all. All led by the Spirit are children of God. It's open to everybody to start this new life, whoever we are, by stepping out into the light of the kingdom to let the seed grow fully. So we, born of physical stock of a human father and mother, had to emerge into the light, and we become children of God by emerging into the light of Christ, into a new life. Now, this idea of born again can become a bit of a burden for many of us. It can weigh us down as we wrestle with the fact that maybe we have not had the moment of a born again experience in the way some have or, or the way some portray it. And I would suggest maybe that the very fact we are wrestling with that question would indicate that there is life there and we should leave the moment of starting 
and go on in the light of Christ. Because the moment of beginning doesn't matter. It's what we do with it. And it's a liberation, this, that Paul speaks about. It shouldn't be a burden to weigh us down. Because Paul says, for one thing, it's about fresh starts. You can leave your past, your regrets, your mistakes, and begin again. Making it all about having the right moment of birth turns it into a burden and sometimes a competition. But the whole point is that it's about life now. What do you do with it now? How do you live it now? And Paul is adamant that it's not a burden, it's not a spirit of slavery or of fear, but a spirit of adoption, setting us free from our past to begin again and again and again. And it's what we do with that life that matters. And the other thing he says here is, is a completely new relationship. The Spirit enables us, he says, to cry out, Abba, Father. It's such a radical change in thinking. You know, we as human parents will gaze into a pram at a, a baby and we'll listen to their babblings and imagine we hear the words Dada or Mama. I mean, the, the parents maybe just practicing with words and experimenting with sounds, but the doting parent doesn't mind. Oh, he said, Daddy, he said, Mummy. Well, in Aramaic, the language of Jesus' time, the word they picked out was Abba, literally, Daddy. We oh, said Abba. And that's the closeness of the new life this allows. A spirit of freedom, of love, of adoption into God's family, and therefore fellow heirs with Christ, heirs to the kingdom. And it's open to all, whatever your heritage, all who come out of the darkness of their own musings and into the light of Christ to follow that way. The moment of born again, this can be treated as a bit of a badge of honour, which is not to detract from those who do have dramatic experiences, but it's to remember that it's not the only way. And it's not the point. It doesn't matter about knowing the date on your spiritual birth certificate. What matters is knowing you're alive and living that life now then we become heirs to a life we cannot yet imagine. Let us pray. To be children of God is to be brought into something so new and radical. It could only be described as rebirth. 
What we were no longer matters. What we are is your sons and daughters. What we will become, still hidden, is your promise and our glorious hope. We offer our thanks in Jesus' name. We dwell in a world with much darkness, for there are places where people are imprisoned and abused merely for their opinions, or who they are, or what they are. We value our freedoms and pray for those struggling against injustice. We pray for light in the darkness. There are places hampered by poverty, no chance of education, health care, denied their birthright as children of God. We pray for light in the darkness. There are many materially well off, yet in the darkness of false teaching and confusion or trapped in wrong. Help us, your church, to proclaim the good news in word and deed. We pray for light in the darkness. If we, or those we know, are in a dark place, help and heal. We pray for light in the darkness. In Jesus' name, Amen.
And now the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.